When they found a leak, the wrinkle was flattened or the gap was filled with sealant. After all leaks were sealed, full pressure was achieved and the vacuum backing process was complete. Applying heat to a curing laminate can help it cure faster and more evenly. We set up some heat lamps to help. We left the vacuum connected for eight hours and then disconnected the pump. We left the part with its vacuum bagging materials in place for another day before continuing. When we removed the vacuum bagging materials, we could see that the peel ply layer had left the desired texture which was perfect for secondary bonding. It was slightly rough and completely dry. We inspected the surface thoroughly and found that the four layers of carbon were densely packed, had no pools of resin, and had no air pockets. Since no additional repair work was necessary before continuing, we were ready to complete the second portion. To begin, we again laid out the pre-cut materials. The honeycomb, fabric, and vacuum bagging materials were laid out on the table in the order of the lamination schedule. This time, a separate bag was pre-fit to the rear wheel arch so little time would be lost once the layup began. We also decided to clean the mold flange with acetone and apply the sealant tape now. This would save time later. The paper strip was left intact knowing that it could be removed easily when we were ready. We are now ready to begin the second lamination where the first layer will be the Nomex honeycomb. To begin, another batch of epoxy was mixed for use as an adhesive. It was poured over the inner surface of the outer skin and spread to form a thick film on all the areas that the honeycomb would cover. Using a mohair roller and squeegees, the resin was worked up the sides and over the surface. The pre-cut Nomex honeycomb was laid in place. Only small relief cuts were necessary for a proper fit. Remember here you guys, work it from the center, like get in, get in the middle here, pull the outside, pull it down from Pull it down from the inside, not from above. Triangle sections of honeycomb were added to stiffen the rear wheel arch support. The epoxy was not tacky enough to completely hold the honeycomb to the vertical surfaces, so some of the students held it in place while the fiber reinforcement was added. The first of the inner skin plies was a zero degree layer of carbon fiber. It was laid in dry and wet out with resin from above. It was important to thoroughly saturate this layer but we didn't want to apply so much resin that it would flow profusely into the cells of the core. However, most of the resin that did run through the fabric into the honeycomb would be sucked back up into the fabric by the vacuum process. This stage is tricky because you need to make sure the fabric contacts all surfaces below it, but air pockets will still appear because the honeycomb is filled with air. These air pockets will also be removed during vacuum bagging. Don't pull it up, okay? Right. Keep it down in here. Don't like crease it. Like, you can't just stick the thing in. You gotta make sure that when you do that, the bottom is all in place. We next applied the second inner skin layer with a 45 degree orientation to the vehicle axis. It was possible to add more resin to this layer and work it through to the first without filling the core cells. Resin was still being mixed carefully, batch by batch, as needed for each layer. The third layer of this layup was the seventh and final layer of the part. After the excess resin was removed with squeegees, we were ready to again lay in the vacuum bagging materials. Each ply had covered the wheel hub and the flange was wetted down with every ply. The vacuum bagging process was the same as before. First we laid in the same porous peel ply. Next we put in breather. Again it was positioned to guide airflow underneath the couplings. Finally the bag was laid in. Again the bag had two couplings already attached. However, this time the bag for the wheel hub was already made. It was simply a matter of dropping it over and attaching it to the rest of the bag. We could also simply peel off the protective paper from the sealant tape and attach the bag much more quickly. We needed to gather extra bagging material in the contoured nose, so a large pleat was made. This was sealed with tape to itself and to the flange. We compressed the inner to the outer skin around the beveled edge of the honeycomb. We needed all excess air removed to avoid a shear failure. After connecting the vacuum and checking for leaks, only 45 minutes had passed, a considerable improvement over the first portion. We were delighted because this layup even included the honeycomb. With the full pressure achieved, the entire assembly was covered by a makeshift tent. Inside the tent, space heaters and heat lamps raised the temperature to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. We were working at nearly outside temperatures, which were about 70 degrees. 
The tent would contain the heat and ensure a good bond between the first portion, the honeycomb, and the rest of the three layers of graphite. The part was allowed to cure for eight hours under heat and vacuum. After that, the tent and heat sources were removed, the pump was disconnected, and the shell lamination finished its cure cycle at atmospheric pressure. The shell remained in the mold for an additional three days before we proceeded. This was due more to scheduling conflicts than to completely cure the part. However, the part should remain in the mold for at least 24 hours before trying to release it. The tape was pulled from the flange to release the bag. The bag was easily removed and discarded. The peel ply and bleeder cloth were easily pulled free from the surface. The inner skin appeared to be true and void free. It had bonded well to both the honeycomb and the outer skin. We are now ready for the seventh and final step of mold making, which is to release the part from the mold. Mold release for a part this large and this rigid can really be difficult. This release went quite well for two reasons. First, it helped that it had been left in the mold for so long. The longer a part sits, the easier it will be to get it to release. Second, the dowel holes we had drilled in the bottom really helped a lot. After we had pried at it enough to get the flange and hub loosened a little, we turned the mold over so that we could reach the dowel holes. We had filled these holes with clay when we did the lamination so the resin would not run out. Plus, neither resin nor fabric would stick to the clay. We had to get the clay out so that we could get the dowels in, but it wasn't necessary to get it all out. We were careful not to scratch the shell. We put the dowel rods in so that we could pound them evenly to apply uniform pressure to try and release the bottom. It's out on the sides. Yes. Look at it. Isn't that good? Yeah, it is. It looks like to me, but okay, I can hang on. We'll get some press there then. See if you can get off the back of this thing. Maybe you can get something under here a little bit. I mean, whatever you can, because it's going to be grabbing there. Finally, we were able to shake it loose. Whoa, man! Put it on the scale. You got to move the scale. Hang on. It's not scratching. Oh, look it's at the light, bottom man. of that. Let's get the two oh, of us. This thing is light. Set up a saw horse, right there. We were delighted with the finished shell. It was shiny and free of pinholes. We had calculated that even with the flange still on, the shell should weigh about 20 pounds. 19 pounds was fantastic. 